I'd like to get started, and I want to introduce our very own UM uh, VPIT and CIO, Dr. Ravi Penzi, who's going to be our first panel speaker for our leadership discussion uh, this morning. Um, so I'm going to ask Dr. Penzi to come up and uh, just introduce him um, and, and reiterate his, that he has a focus on, a laser focus on um, customer service, and his goal is to get the University of Michigan to be a leader in the appropriate use of technology in the higher education domain. Dr. Penzi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so how, how is the morning been so far? It's been great. How was the poster session? Uh, excellent. Well, the, the back there, the, that person is really enthusiastic back there. He's going like this. Thank you. I like, the, I, I like that spirit. Thank you. He's saying, oh, I'm just the volunteer. That's what he's saying. Uh, he, he's showing his shirt, that it says. But it's a, it's a privilege to be with all of you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving me this time. Uh, I'm really, really grateful for the opportunity to serve as uh, the VP and CIO of this amazing institution and really represent all of you. I'm, I'm you know, humbled by the opportunity and uh, what this institution is and the uh, incredible individuals I got a chance to meet uh, here so far. I'm in my fourth month and I'm still here. Uh, so, which is good, uh, and so intend to be here for a long time with uh, support and help from all of you. Uh, but what I wanted to do was really, I stand before you in utmost humility, and I want to share with you uh, something that my mother taught me a long time ago. And the reason I want to share that with you is because as I've been here for four months, I have learned a lot from many of you in this room and beyond. I've seen every one of you as a teacher, where uh, many things that I didn't know you taught me you explain to me the culture, the values, how things work here, and it all ties back to seeing a teacher in each one of you. So where does that come from? That really comes from my mother. When I was seven years old, she taught me these three Sanskrit phrases, and uh, if you speak Sanskrit, great. If you don't, you're just out of luck. Uh, no, no actually, actually, I will translate. Uh, it goes something like this, matru deva power. Mother is made in the image of God and should be respected as one would respect God. Pitru Deva Bhava, Father is made in the image of God and should be respected as one would respect God. Last but not the least and most important for this group, Acharya Deva Bhava, Acharya's teacher. Teacher is made in the image of God and should be respected as one would respect God. And that's why I see a teacher in everyone I get a chance to interact with because I learn. So what I'm wanting to challenge you to think about is, as we look at Michigan IT Symposium, as we look at all of these opportunities to learn, I hope you'll take time and you'll see a teacher in each other. That way we can learn from each other, we can collaborate, we can innovate, and if we do that, we will be seen as a leader in the appropriate use of technology and beyond in the entire world. Because that's the power, that's the power of collaboration, that's the power of learning, that's the power of teaching each other. So I hope you do that. And as I have spent time in IT, uh, you know, there's a lot about me you might have read, but there's something about me that you may not know. Uh, change. Change is something we're very comfortable with in IT, right? Because that's something we live with, right? Every day you see change. Do you all agree that our field continues to change and evolve? And you obviously are far smarter than I am because uh, I was not uh, really prepared for change. Because prior to getting into IT, I was actually seven feet tall, and I played as a center for Los Angeles Lakers. I really did. And then I got into the field of IT, and this is what happened. And I was really not prepared to handle that change. Uh, so I asked myself this question. I said, how did this happen? And uh, then I realized the change was really right in front of me, but I did not see it. Uh, the acronym CIO does not stand for Chief Information Officer. It stands for career is over, okay? <laughs> my, my basketball career was over. Thankfully, my IT career sustained, and you know why it sustained? Because I had a lot of great teachers, great teachers like all of you. That's why my IT career sustained. So jokes aside, people have asked me, you know, what have you learned while you've been here for the time uh, to, uh, here? And so one of the things I did learn this morning, which was kind of a little exciting, uh, is that my car has anti-lock brakes, which was good. Okay, uh, which is good, as I slid to work. Uh, no, no, nothing serious, but it was kind of exciting, actually. Uh, for somebody who hasn't driven a lot on snow, it can be quite exciting. And so uh, it was fun. And, uh, but more importantly, uh, as we evolve, as I talk to folks, one of the questions I ask my colleagues and beyond and others, and I ask that question of you, 
how would you answer this question if I asked you, where is our data? Where is our data? How would we answer that question? So when I asked that question of my colleagues in ITS and beyond, they all smiled, they looked at each other, and they said, it's kind of everywhere and anywhere. That's what they said. And so the reason I asked that question is uh, not because we want to control data, but we actually want to enable and empower the use of that data. Enable and empower the use of that data so that we can all, we can all at the institution make data-informed decisions, not data-driven. Think about the difference between the two. Data-informed decision-making, not data-driven decision-making. And I'm happy to engage with you about that later on if you like. We also looked at what should our future network look like? Because as we talk about cloud, as we talk about moving things to cloud, moving uh, cycles to cloud, moving storage to cloud, you hear a lot about cloud. But there are some interesting challenges. Cloud is not the answer for every problem. Because as you move things to cloud, as you move things to cloud, our external bandwidth needs are going to change. You don't want that to become a bottleneck. So what does our future network look like? What should it look like? It's not going to be up to for me to decide, not for Andrew to decide, not for Kerry to decide. We should all be deciding that together because so many brilliant minds in this room. So we're having conversations about that as we're learning from each other. We're also talking about service excellence. Kayla talked a lot about uh, what she said involved user experience, you know, user-centric design. Uh, you know, she gave the example of her dad about how her dad is so much more, it's easier for him to use a tablet versus the old mouse and PC and so on. Why? It was the iPhone, 2007, touch screen. That dramatically changed how we relate to technology. My dad, who is no longer alive, loved the innovation of Kindle, the book reader. Why did he love that? Because, you know what, simple thing, the ability to increase the font size. Because as he got older, he was having trouble seeing. And he absolutely did not want to use a magnifying glass. That would have been a problem for him. And so he did not feel comfortable with that. So the Kindle was an amazing innovation for him. I mean, he just loved his Kindle. He, I mean, he used to get literally worked up if the Kindle was not charged. Uh, and, and, you know, and, he, and he would call me from India and say, can you charge my Kindle? And I, you know, uh, I was here. And I said, Dad, don't worry. The Kindle saves battery for many, many weeks. And he's like, no, 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 I want to charge. I mean, he used to get, so, that, so that's the world we live in, user-centric. We talked a lot, about, a lot about that. So what I'm trying to say to you is we have so many amazing opportunities to make a difference together. So what I want to do is end my conversation with you uh, with a, and we have a great panel coming up here, with a Sanskrit phrase that goes something like this. By the time you're done, you're going to be Sanskrit experts, I'm telling you. Uh, it goes something like this. Anho badraha, anho badraha, kratavo yantu vishvataha. Anho badraha, kratavo yantu vishvataha. It's a mouthful, so I'll translate. What it really means is, let innovative thoughts, let in innovative thoughts come from all around the world or let innovative thoughts come from all around this room, or let innovative thoughts come from our outstanding panel that's going to come up to the stage now. So I'm going to invite our panel members to come here, and no pressure, they're going to be our engines of innovation. And as they're settling in, um, I wanted to uh, share with you a few things that you may already know. But as you know, um, Dan Malata is the Executive Director of Engineering IT, does an amazing, amazing job there, um, supporting some of our you know, demanding you know, faculty colleagues and others and students. Uh, but what you may not know about Dan is, uh, Dan, is a, Dan has a twin brother. How many of you knew that, that Dan has a twin? Okay, uh, and so there you go. So that's the power of the information, data-informed research, right? Uh, and, and it turns out, that uh, Dan's twin went to that other school in Michigan, and Dan made the wiser choice by coming to the University of Michigan. So thank you, Dan, for doing that. Uh, uh, and Carrie, I'm, I'm sure all of you know Carrie serves as the uh, CIO at Dearborn campus, but has had many, many roles on this campus as well, and very much plugged in and such a collaborative leader. But Carrie also runs marathons. How many of you knew that? He runs, she runs marathons and does amazing, amazing jobs. So I'm taking some tips from her on how to start running maybe one of these days. And uh, 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 exactly, I'm like, oh, chill, let's take it easy. Uh, you know, it's too cold out there. And so uh, 
Andrew uh, uh, Rosenbaum, everybody knows him, and he serves as the CIO of the Michigan Medicine, and does an amazing job, and he's been a great mentor to me since, uh, actually, even before I arrived. He was extremely helpful in guiding and suggesting and really advising, and he's still available to me anytime I need advice. So, Andrew, thank you for all of your support. And one thing you may not know about Andrew is, Andrew actually has been to the base camp of Mount Everest as the doctor of the team that hiked all the way to the Mount Everest. So, so some amazing talent, not just IT talent, medical talent, leadership, we got everything here. So are you excited about the panel then? Yeah, let's see what they have to say. And uh, during this panel, even though uh, we told the first panel that is, you, guys, you guys are actually more special, you'll find out why, okay? <laughs> He's like, he probably said that to the other panel as well. No, I didn't actually. Uh, so, so Carrie, I would really want to start with you. Um, as I indicated, you had had a lot of roles on this campus, and of course, you are at uh, Dearborn now. And along the way, you have found some amazing ways to collaborate, partner with various entities across. So could you talk about the power of that and things that you've accomplished along the way? And what advice do you have for people here in terms of partnering and collaborating? So that's a big question. Let me just start out by saying I, I have had the privilege of having a few roles on, on campus here. I did my MBA at U of M Flint um, and really enjoyed my time there. And now I've been at Dearborn for two years. So it's interesting being in the different seats. And, and boy, you really, I think, respect and appreciate um, what's happening uh, with people in different seats when you've had a few different ones, right? Uh, it gives you a lot more understanding. So I, I wanted to just kick off by saying, you know, at Dearborn, really, I feel like um, what collaboration does is it really magnifies and amplifies what we can do. So, you know, here in, in Ann Arbor and the health system and, and everywhere, there's 2,000 people in Michigan IT, and we have 30 of them. And boy, we're running um, a regional comprehensive institution, you know, with 30 people, um, which is amazing. And the staff has tons of ingenuity and just hustle and love for our mission of changing students' lives. But um, they need to focus on you know, what needs to happen hands-on in Dearborn, which is a lot of stuff. And there are some things that we can really piggyback on what's already happening in Ann Arbor and do it a lot more quickly. Uh, one of the examples, I, Don Lambert was sitting right here last session. Um, my first meeting, I think, at Dearborn was Don coming out to talk about Apps Anywhere, uh, this software that they had been using at engineering to stream licensed software on student devices and lab devices. And it's important for us as a commuter campus um, where students have a lot of licensed software needs for engineering and other things, and they aren't uh, residential, they're not at labs, they're doing things weird hours, they have jobs and family uh, requirements. So he was demonstrating that along with um, Mark Personet and my desktop providing the back end, and so uh, we ended up piloting that. And actually just this last summer worked between ITS, uh, engineering, and, and Dearborn to sign a contract with them, which we got much better rates and, and than we would ever have been able to do by ourselves. We're kind of a little fish with some of these vendors, but when we partner with Ann Arbor, um, they pay a lot more attention um, and we're able to do a lot more. And in addition, we were able to get a lot of expertise from Don um, on how to deploy it and how to troubleshoot it and you know how to just manage it. So that was awesome um, thing that happened. One other thing, I, I don't want you guys to miss uh, Robert Ward and Shajib uh, Ghosh and Patrick Steffes are doing a student identity management session. And that's an example of us working with um, the identity management folks in Ann Arbor to take what was previously actually a postal mail process of students getting their unique name and password just this past year was converted into an online digital process where students choose their own unique names and their own passwords, um, which has led to um, just students having a much better experience. So some of those envelopes were getting lost. Obviously, we're not making it to uh, China or Yemen or Oman or other places where the envelopes need to make their way to. And when I was sitting in the service desk during fall rush this year, the staff were teasing me about whether they were gonna give me access to reset passwords, which is a major chore that typically happens during that time. And I said, you know, there actually haven't been any password resets today. And they kind of went, oh yeah, usually there's a line out the door. And it was because students actually had set their own passwords, right? And so they didn't encounter this process of, oh, I don't know, I may have gotten an envelope, I don't know where it went, um, because the process was digital. And then the last one I wanted to mention was um, we, had a, uh, we had a system that we used to manage our backups in Dearborn, and we knew it was somewhat end of life, and we had some plans around that, and it ended end of life itself a bit early, which is never a good thing. And so we were able to, just within a couple days, Joe Lubomirsky um, was working with Eric Lakin and others here to you know, get us up on my backup, and we ended up pricing that service out against replacing our backup system and determined it was actually much cheaper to just go with my backup and would also save a significant amount of time and just set up and configuration, which um, setting up and configuring a backup server is not 
the A number one priority that, that I want done in Dearborn, right? We can work with Ann Arbor and get that set and it would be just fine. So those are some different examples. Um, as a regional comprehensive, which we really, we, we are, we have different needs also than Ann Arbor does. And just thinking about some things like student recruiting and, and retention, you know, we have a much different student um, population. And so some things we do choose to do there. So we choose to do Salesforce for recruiting, um, EAB for student success. So we have just, we have a lot of first generation students. We have a lot of working students. We you know, have a lot of students with just um, special needs around recruitment and retention. And so we choose to do that ourselves and not necessarily go with Ann Arbor. So we really appreciate the collaboration we have. We can't always collaborate. There are different reasons why it doesn't always make sense or we just don't have time or we wanna do something differently. But um, we super appreciate so many people here um, for helping us. Okay, Eric, thank you. I think the, 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 the power of collaboration and innovation and really coming together and you know, leveraging collaboration where it makes sense and other places, uh, you know, going it alone may make perfect sense as well. So, the, so that's the power of really smart people coming together and figuring out what's the right solution. Um, so, so Andrew, uh, you know, kind of continuing that discussion, uh, and, and I don't know if Jack is in the audience this, uh, during this session or not, but let's assume that we all got together and we solved the cybersecurity problem. We, have, we no longer Brilliant. have any, uh, we, we, we have taken care of it. We have the ma magic wand and we are not worried about cybersecurity anymore. So if I take that off we the table. It. We solved <laughs> it. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Sorry about that. Exactly, yeah. that's great. Let's celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if, yeah, assuming we have done that and people are saying, he, this new guy is so naive, how can he solve cybersecurity? So anyway, uh, let's assuming we have solved that problem, what are some of the things that keep you awake at night as you think about uh, your role and your you know, variety of different roles? Uh, faculty member, professor, tenured you know, practicing doctor, CIO. What keeps you awake? So we, we, we mentioned this in the previous session. These are these great questions that uh, you hear all the time, and I really like them because they're, um, <clears throat> they give you insights into our personalities, our areas of priority. And there's, of course, no right or wrong answer. But from my position, what I am increasingly having to do, and I would say all the panelists as well, <clears throat> One of the, the problems, which is very mundane, is how within our budgets do we try to find the money for grow and transform when increasingly we have to re run and replace? And it's very mundane, but the reality is there's an art to trying to find that. Another, of course, is to retain, uh, build great talent when the entire world is still digitizing and the opportunities of doing new things are only uh, increasing. And so those, I would say, are, are among the things that any CIO and many of you probably have to do. But I, I wanted to try to be a little bit thought provoking. So I would answer Ravi's question by saying, the thing that's most challenging and that keeps me up at night is, how do we go old school? And, and let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had a near disaster in one of our primary data centers where we had to go full throttle stop on our absolutely most critical system, our Epic MyChart system. And the recovery was done extraordinarily well and we're actually gonna be talking more and more about lessons learned because in it, these kinds of lessons are, are powerful. But what if we didn't recover? Then what? And right now, I can tell you that there are really very, very few people left in the health system who actually know how to sustain manual work. We've become so digital. Even simple tasks that used to be just absolutely day-to-day, -day, like writing an order with pen and paper, what paper, who gets it, how do you deliver it, what do the pharmacies do, absolutely fundamental tasks are actually now becoming atrophied. And so the problem is not the ones that you might normally think about, there, how do we, as digital um, natives, one of Gartner's great words, how do we, as IT experts, but knowing our various areas of the business, actually help maintain the skills necessary to do that work? So imagine if the student grading system shut down for two weeks the day before finals or two days before finals. Are we going to ask students and our staff and faculty to stay two weeks into a holiday to, uh, to redo that work when our digital systems are up? Uh, how about uh, the beginning of fall semesters when uh, absolutely critical registration systems are not just down, 
They're down for days or weeks. What does this mean if and when our systems go down for a prolonged period of time, and how do we maintain continuity of operations? Very few people, I would actually be not so provocative, challenging, I think there's no one really working on that. And if you have areas where you're doing it really well, I'd love to hear about it because we still struggle with how do we practice it. So my answer to that question of what keeps me up at night is not cryptocurrency mining. Please don't do cryptocurrency mining. <laughs> Just don't. Don't. It's not all the cyber issues that you said. Those are the real ones. And those are ones that get Mark Schlissel and Martin Filbert and our leaders very interested. No question. They're not PHI and data breaches. Those are the things we talk about. In some ways, it might be the more mundane and hidden that we don't talk about, but when and if it, if that data center did not come up, if we had not done enormous investments in continuity, we would be down for days or weeks in our most mission critical areas. And that's the thing that I don't think we're talking about enough. No, I, I think that's a, a interesting point, and um, this is not to be critical of anybody, and this, was, this had nothing to do with, uh, you know, per se, any IT organization. Uh, but uh, Stephanie is like, oh, he's going there. Uh, but my, my, my first um, uh, four weeks were kind of exciting uh, because every week my health insurance was getting canceled. Uh, we have no idea why. And, and so I would go to the CVS pharmacy to pick up something and say, oh, you don't have health insurance. And finally it became a joke where the CVS pharmacy started asking me uh, to the effect, are you sure they're not trying to send you a message? <laughs> That's what they said. So they're still working on figuring it out. Last I checked, I have health insurance now, so I'm all good. But, but point was, it was a process where they were trying to manually fix something, and the computerized process overnight was overriding whatever they had manually fixed. And all this was happening because I happened to have a dry faculty appointment, and the system was getting somehow confused. But there are 50 other people who have, or 1,000 other people, but hopefully they have figured this all out now. But point being, the computerization and the manual process not quite talking to each other can be quite challenging. And you know, we've talked about this, but from a panel point of view, one of the things we talked about when we were talking about what we want to speak about is we very, very strongly and sincerely talk about collaboration right. and the desire to share stories. These are these examples where when we learn about one system and how we're doing these automated overrides that you know happen in other areas. And so it might not sound immediately that's an, that's an opportunity for collaboration, but these problems are some of those areas for us and how we look for collaboration across the overall U of M. No, no, absolutely. Uh, so, so Dan, uh, continuing that conversation, uh, uh, a friend of mine who happens to be the CIO for Cisco Systems uh, always jokingly says that uh, that's kind of the hardest job because uh, every employee of the Cisco system believes that they are an IT expert and, and have ideas on how IT should be run, and there is the CIO trying to you know, uh, deal with 50,000 IT experts. And so, Dan, you happen to be in College of Engineering, my home, home college, and I know we have phenomenal faculty members who uh, work with technology, are at the edge of the technology, have designed systems that we use, uh, innovations that we use. So how do you balance the need to support their innovative spirit and in pushing that edge? with scale at which you have to offer services. So can you give us some guidance, wisdom on how you deal with that? Yeah, we, we do it in a couple ways. Um, you know, one way, obviously, is, is trying to be there to support those faculty who are innovating in new technology areas. Um, a lot of times they're great at that individual technology and really want to do things there. It's the operations of it and how it fits in with the bigger system and how the other pieces actually fit in is where, where we can spend some time. Uh, I think recognizing that we, we can't build a system that solves everything. Uh, and a great example that I have is, is uh, uh, classrooms. So we do a lot of classroom technology. Um, you know, more and more we get faculty that really want to be innovative in that space. And so it started with simple things like clickers, and then it became, well, I want uh, iPads, and I want to be able to write on my iPad and have it recorded, and I want to now be able to walk around the room with my iPad and have that recorded. And how do we integrate an Apple TV in a room so people can do that? And, and then you have somebody else that says, well, I just want my chalkboard. I don't want any of this. I just want to be able to write on my chalkboard. If you're going to make me lecture capture, I will. But all you'll see is the back of my head as I'm writing on the whiteboard or on the chalkboard with my piece of chalk. And we had to support that whole gamut of users. And so some, we had to figure out where's that sweet spot between the, the really far out there user who's really pushing the envelope and the user that really likes it, how they've done it for the last 10, 20, 30 years. And so trying to find that middle ground is important. I think we can do a lot of things that are self-service. 
and that are flexible. So trying to provide services that um, a, a faculty member or a student can use, you know, at midnight if they decide, hey, it's time for me to start using this, they can get online and do it all themselves. They don't need help. Um, and again, the classroom example, it's, it's lecture capture. Um, some people really want to get involved and make really polished lecture recordings. Other people just want to capture their course. And so if an instructor can just type three things into a Google spreadsheet or Google form, hit submit, and know that it all just happens for them, that's the perfect level of you know, effort for them. And the other ones who want to do more can get into the system and tinker and, and cut out bits. And they didn't like the way that sounded, so they cut that out and they re-edited a new uh, speech in. But how do we make those systems flexible? I, I think communication is a big piece. Uh, Two-way communication, I, I'm having them understand what services we have to offer, going out and listening to what their needs are. Um, and I think in this technology age, you know, while I have all these experts in IT, everyone can do it right for themselves. Uh, we're seeing that more across the board, right? Everybody has a smartphone. And if we don't have a solution for them or they don't know where to find our solution, they get out their smartphone and they go to the Apple store and they type in, you know, spreadsheet tools or databases and they pull up an app and hey this got four you know 4.5 stars by three million people this must be great I'll download that and use that as my database from now on not understanding what's happening behind the scenes um, so how do we actually curate that list then for them give them some options of tools they could use a one size fits all won't work but as everybody becomes a technology expert how do we actually work in an environment where we're getting two-way communication uh, where we do tools that we have to do um, I think there's really explaining the why. Why do you have to use this tool? Why do you have to do this this way? Why can't you just go do it however you want to? Um, if we can't get that why out early enough, um, we've lost them. If it's the point that they think it's being pushed on them versus they're, they're doing it for a reason, uh, they're more likely to resist doing it. Um, and then I think the other, the other example I wanted to share, uh, it ties into some of the things about understanding the problems we're having and how to fix them is we have a lot of engineering students that are also very crafty. Uh, we had uh, probably, yeah, they're mining Bitcoin, they are, actually. Um, we, they're we, using my servers, Bitcoin. Dan. Yeah, we, we had, uh, 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 printing was broken from our Linux student computing environment for probably two months one term. Nobody ever called the help desk. They fixed it themselves by writing in the lab that it was broken on, on the whiteboard, how to work around the problem. So we had to really be careful about where we're actually an impediment and people don't know to contact us because everybody figures out how to work around the problem. Uh, for innovation in, in these areas, I think it's, it's leveraging students. So student employees are a great resource. I think the first uh, uh, Hadoop uh, big data cluster that was available on campus, uh, we took a student employee and said, hey, go figure out Hadoop for us. He's a bright student was eager in the space and went and figured it out. And that became the original uh, big data cluster for campus that, that Flux rolled out. Um, and then how do we drop services we don't need? So we really have to be focused on uh, where our services are unique and the things we have to do. I think we don't need to do storage anymore, we do, you know, from a, a college level perspective especially. So we've moved off you know, dealing with storage ourselves. Where are our services good enough that we can then uh, pass off to others to do, so we can really focus on those things that are new and innovative. And then how do we increase the skill set of everybody on new technology? So how do we share information back and forth? We have brown bags and other sessions, even between technical staff, where one staff is passionate in uh, serverless processing in the cloud, that he goes and then talks to everybody else about how he's doing it, so that we all can kind of grow our knowledge, so we can start working those new innovative spaces. So, so can I go off script? Please. Okay. Uh -huh. Can I ask you a really difficult question in the middle of this panel? Um, you didn't really expect me not to, did you? So you, you and I were both kind of talking about focusing staff on things that are sort of critical for our, our institution, our college. So as a staff member, I might hear that and think, so what Dan's saying is I don't have a future, right? Like th th my job is no longer important because I work on storage or you know, whatever. What would, you, what would you say to staff who are kind of facing that thought process? Yeah, I think we think about that a lot because we are trying to really focus. Technology is changing so quickly and the cycles of change are happening so fast that we have to really be thinking ahead. And so we really talk to staff and starting to talk to staff in those areas that maybe we're not going to do in a couple of years um, about what is that next technology that I think is interesting and passionate to them. 
or how do they apply the skills they have in a slightly different area? How do they, they, they pivot more than you know, re-educate, but that apply their skills in a, in a slightly different way? Um, but sharing with them a vision of where their career could be and what they're ta just talking with them about what their aspirations are. How do they want to see their career develop? What interests them? What kinds of, not necessarily individual technology topics, but what types of activities interest them? And how do we actually understand how their career kind of goes out to that? But you know, there's so many examples of this. And this is something we talked about last time and we continue talking about. Um, I, I've tried to use some of the really big projects that I know are campus-wide to try to stimulate still some more of this, uh, whether it's networking, storage, cybersecurity. But there are uh, ERP, I think, down the road will be another huge example of this cross U of M uh, uh, opportunity for people who may have been doing something before now, one could say, well, now I'm just doing it in a different system, when really what we want is to say there are also different ways to do it. And one example to me that's very concrete is what we're doing with ServiceNow. So uh, Michael Warden and our group and others have taken something that I think is really important to recognize. On one hand, IT service management is among the most expected and common things we have to do, and therefore any platform that we use to do that should feel sort of just routine, basic work that is somewhat unique to us as IT providers. So if we said ITSM in other arenas, they would say, what are you talking about for us? Hopefully we get an idea about it. But that platform, and this is not so much pushing the platform, it's how to work differently gets to some of these examples. I'm no longer just a business analyst working in a new platform. I'm using data to drive business processes in different ways. And these are examples that we all can start using across U of M. I'm just using that as one example because we've called that our internal EPIC project mm -hmm. because we understood we want to do it very differently. And the way Michael and the team and others around the campus are speaking about it, that would be a, a tangible example of hundreds where you could say, I'll just do what I've been doing in a new platform. That's not in many ways the goal. It's how to do services in a new way. The platform can help, <clears throat> and the platform can stimulate discussion that crosses divisions uh, in many ways. And where we find those examples, to me, are, to me, very concrete ways of, of pushing what you just said. No, I think um, a, a lot of uh, you know, great and interesting points here. And um, I have always talked to you know, groups such as these and others when we have had conversations about the idea that uh, the field we chose to be in, which is you know, information technology, uh, continues to evolve at a rapid pace. We talked about at the beginning, my, beginning of my remarks about one thing that's constant in our life is change. I also want you to think about it that change is a six-letter word, but so is leader. Okay, so think about that. And so we have an opportunity to lead. Uh, so there is no job security in our field, but what we have is career security if you're planning to evolve. And other businesses are evolving, so we need to be prepared to do that. And I know you all do a great job, but think about this. Uh, how often do you go to a bank these days? How often do you go to a bank? Think about it. Uh, only five years ago, you pretty much had to go to bank for any business that you needed to transact but you don't go to banks as much. You can do everything with that smartphone in your pocket. Depositing, withdrawing, moving money, doing whatever you need to do. You can do all of that. So the banking business has evolved. That doesn't mean they've gotten rid of people. What has happened is the types of expertise that the people had to have had to evolve so they can provide higher level of service. Maybe you're not going there to deposit and withdraw money, but maybe you're going there for other types of conversations. How often do you actually go to a counter at an airport and check in? That has evolved too. We don't do that anymore. We print boarding passes, we move on, we do things. How often do you actually check in in a hotel? These days with your smartphones, they are able to give you the keys right on your smartphone. You can go open the door with your smartphone. Hilton Hotels has been doing this in many, many properties and so have been others. So look at it this way. So does that mean those folks at the front desk of the Hilton are without a job? No, they're actually there. What they're doing, however, is after you check in, a few hours later they call you and say, how has been the service? Can we help you with something else? And you kind of